Should I start in or? Uh, yeah, what? Should I? So guys, I think uh, it's time. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, it's it's time to start again. We are a little bit uh, uh, behind, uh, so better to to move on. Uh, my name is Michele Cecchini. I'm based at OECD. Uh, it's my pleasure to chair uh, this last session on valuing protection against health-related financial risk. Uh, the format is the same uh, as as we had uh, throughout uh, the last day and half. Uh, so I would start by inviting uh, uh, Jonathan Skinner uh, as a presenter uh, of the paper, and then we'll have uh, uh, two discussants uh, uh, discussing on the paper, in particular uh, Calypso Chalicou uh, from the Center for Global Development in Imperial College London, and then uh, Mark Shepard uh, from Harvard University. Uh, so please, G uh, Jonathan uh, from Dartmouth College, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I want to thank at the outset my discussants, both of them, for many uh, helpful comments uh, before the, the talk. Um, the, uh, the, the topic here, I, I, uh, this is a, a co-authored with Dean, who I think is probably feeling like uh, General Kelly any time that uh, President Trump gives a press conference. Uh, a little nervous about what I'm going to say, but uh, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, uh, I I, I want to start with the motivation of the paper, uh, and that is that there's a tremendous interest now in uh, expanding health coverage around the world. Um, I, the the classic statement I think is is this uh, paper uh, that was mentioned earlier. Um, and if you count up the number of times you see uh, the initials UHC, it uh, counts up to 57. Uh, so clearly there's an interest uh, in, in, uh, in, in appealing to universal health coverage as a way to sort of try to help to reduce uh, health disparities around the world. Um, but the problem is that it's, it's, re it's very, very difficult to value the benefits and the cost of of, of uh, health insurance, and and so what we did in this paper, in this short paper, is we, not breaking any new uh, 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 frontiers, but try to kind of summarize what is it that we know about um, these uh, benefits and costs and with regard to financial valuation, and in particular, how to reconcile kind of what we think of as the benefits of health uh, insurance with some newer uh, papers uh, from the United States that seem to kind of, which might appear at first reading to cast doubt on that. And one of the, the best papers is, is uh, uh, by uh, Mark Shepard and co-authors, and so we're delighted to have him here to kind of talk a little bit about that. So for those of you who are tired from equations from last time, don't please don't worry. Uh, I can talk through this, but there is sort of a little bit of a basis. This is what economists get paid for. Um, and so the idea is you just have a very simple two-period model. You're kind of young or you're old, and when you're young, you're healthy. Um, I see lots of young, healthy people out there, and then when you get to be my age, you start worrying about illnesses and things like that. And so there's a probability of good health, there's a probability of bad health, and, and there's a probability of no health, which is uh, the absence of either good or bad health, which is equivalent to death. Um, and so the idea is that health, you know, the obvious first idea is what's the value of health insurance? It's the value that uh, you can increase of increasing your health spending in either the good state of the world, in which case you, you're in better, that increases the probability of, of being in good health, or uh, the lower chance of poor health. And, um, and presumably that also, health insurance also reduces the probability of actually dying as well. But we do have these three states of the world, and we want to kind of move more people into that good state of, of health. Now, the evidence is sometimes mixed. Uh, I'm sure some of uh, that you you're familiar with the Oregon, uh, uh, essentially a randomized trial of uh, expanding coverage uh, in Medicaid, um, and uh, and that and there they found uh, that. Although depression declined and self-reported health went up, I'll talk a little bit about that, that essentially that on biomarkers there was really uh, no evidence at all. Our friends at Forbes magazine uh, jumped on this right away. 
uh, aha, no significant effect uh, on health outcomes versus being uninsured. This is after a two-week period. I mean, sorry, a two-year period of follow-up. Um, and if we look at uh, the assessment, which oddly enough was only nine months after the um, a similar uh, expansion of coverage in Mexico, similar results were found. So we might start getting worried that, you know, we're, we're, where's, where, where are the health benefits here? Um, now, to be fair, there's the other side of the, of the coin. Um, for covering kids, uh, there appear to be long-term benefits in the U.S. Um, Medicaid policy, and now we have enough time that we're following the then children out into their early adulthood and finding that people in Medicaid expansion states were more, are more likely to have jobs and not be on AFDC. Um, and in the Oregon uh, Health Experiment, uh, there is a large, this large increase in self-reported health, which for any of you who have ever run regressions, you know that that's actually uh, probably the best predictor of mortality that you could imagine. Um, maybe it's a sort of a peace of mind to, uh, uh, that is a little bit hard to value. Um, also, a substantial increase in credit scores because emergency rooms aren't dunning people for uh, payments. And uh, a very nice uh, paper from a few years ago uh, really did this pretty carefully and found that actually credit scores were pretty highly predictive of uh, cardiovascular risk. Maybe it's not having uh, people calling you up and saying, how come you haven't paid your, your rent? But it's, uh, it's remarkable to me how much credit scores uh, seem to be predictive of mortality. And this is actually a research topic that I'm uh, looking at as well, using some, uh, uh, hoping to use some Equifax data, which uh, <laughs> was really easy to download, by the way. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you should uh, be sure to pay your credit card. It's a running a little late. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Um, so, uh, and, and there is some observation, some evidence from observational studies. I sort of put a yellow check on that because it's not quite as clean. But, uh, but you know, we, we shouldn't be giving up on, on the value of, of uh, health, per se, uh, from insurance just yet. But it's just to say that the evidence is sometimes mixed. Um, well, there's another source of, of value, and that is um, it reduces consumption risk and uncertainty. And, and again, uh, don't worry about the equation, but basically what this says is that there, there are sort of two benefits of insurance. One is, and we all have known this for a long time, risk pooling, that is, that in the bad state of the world, that when you suddenly get hit with all of these medical expenses, that that doesn't cause your fam you and your family to uh, be subject to catastrophic health care expenses and, and, to, and to basically not have money for non-medical expenses for the family. Um, and so this protects you against that kind of catastrophic risk. And that's been shown over and over again that that's true in, in the Mexican uh, study and, and from the introduction of Medicare and from other sources as well. Um, the others, which is, I think, less conventional, is this idea of intertemporal consumption smoothing. That is that, that the characteristic of most kind of national insurance plans is that you pay more when you're young and you get the benefits later on. And so you, you're not sort of sitting around and waiting uh, to kind of get to be my age when you suddenly start to have to pay enormous premiums, but instead you kind of prepay, and that, that uh, can sometimes offset effects of, say, hyperbolic discounting or generally discounting the future. And, um, and so that may explain in part why revealed preference for health insurance doesn't always look so great, uh, because... You could say, oh, well, people, you know, they don't, they think they're invincible and they don't realize that they may get sick as they get older. Um, but the third uh, uh, reason is that health insurance can provide a mechanism for income redistribution. I think it's a very important source as well. And it's something that uh, I think everybody can live with a lot more easily uh, be, uh, to redistribute resources through health insurance rather than giving people cash directly. And the way that you can do it, again, with the equation is you just make sure that in every state of the world, if you're in a low-income group, that the premiums that you pay or the taxes that you pay for health insurance are always less than the expected value of the benefit. And 
oftentimes when people talk about why we need health insurance, they're talking as much about redistribution as about risk pooling, and they get the two confused as well. And so, for example, um, and I think that's sort of a, a worthwhile thing that you, you really do. It, it is worthwhile keeping straight both the risk pooling reduction of, of insurance where you pay the actual actuarial their value in order to reduce risk versus the fact that someone else is paying your premium. And so, for example, the Medicaid benefit, the Medicaid expansion gets you both. Taxpayers paying for your health benefits and it reduces your risk. And sometimes the two can be mixed up together. So this terrific paper by Mark um, and, and, uh, and others uh, shows, uh, first of all, that that actually if you look at the value uh, that people seem to place on, on, on enrolling in sort of a Medicaid type plan in Massachusetts, that they don't seem to put a huge amount of value on it. That is, they're not buying in. The, the demand curve doesn't suggest enormous value. Uh, and, uh, and you could explain it by, well, they're hyperbolic discounting or, or they're, you know, they don't, maybe they don't put as much value on their on their life as others do. Um, but, um, uh, but even so, it's still, a, it's sort of a surprising result. But there was another study that, that tries to kind of get around these problems by uh, assessing, you know, some more objective measures of health. And, um, <laughs> and so once again, Forbes is sort of on the job here. Um, but what they show is all of these studies show is, you know, basically like the people who are getting benefits value it at about 30 cents on the dollar up to maybe 50 cents on the dollar. And so it's like, well, wait a minute. I thought, you know, economists were saying that, that, uh, that insurance is really valuable. And so a quick calculation so I can post these numbers so you can sort of check them. But basically, here's the, here's the thing. This is from data from the Oregon experiment. Let's value the health insurance at $1,400, sort of half risk pooling, half transfer. Um, before uh, insurance came along, you had uncompensated care. So you could go to the emergency room, and by law, you, you'd get some treatment. It wouldn't be great, but you'd get some. But now you're getting more. So, so your out-of-pocket spending goes down after you get Medicaid. Your uncompensated care goes down after you get Medicaid. But your total health spending goes from $2,700 before to $3,600 after. So you end up with $900 net increase in actual health care. And so if you do the cost effectiveness ratio relative to, to the increase of $900 in spending, you get pretty good cost effectiveness, like 1.6, so 60% in addition to the dollar you spent. But if you do it relative to the increase in Medicaid spending, that is the increase in government spending on the program, you only get like 40 cents. And that's the essential way to explain why they get these seemingly odd results. And the reason is because they don't know how to value the transfer to, the, to those who are getting uncompensated care. That's the mystery. It's a black box. Nobody knows anything. And there's some evidence, but the key question is who benefits from this reduction in uncompensated care? Well, here's an example from the 1930s in Texas. This is why Blue Cross Blue Shield was first started, because back then hospitals were, were struggling. They had no money. People bought in chickens. They would paint or do work. Nurses would come in and beg us to give them a job without pay. And so here, health insurance helped these hospitals to invest in new technologies and become viable financial institutions. But now, <laughs> another study, recent study, showed that, you know, when suddenly Medicare reimbursement rates went up, what did hospitals do with the money? Well, they increased the payroll. 80% <laughs> uh, boost to CEO salary. So uh, more utilization. So here, you know, it's, it's not clear that, the, that these benefits are necessarily considered net benefits. But the real question is, if we're thinking about low and middle income countries, what is, first of all, is there uncompensated care? Um, you know, how much of, how much uh, it would universal health insurance provide in terms of additional uh, 
benefits that would then be uh, where where sort of the where this uncompensated care would be could be actually scaled back. This gets back to Larry Summers' comment on fungibility. If you increase your own spending, your own spending on health, does that lead to a reduction in in spending by say external aid agents? Um, so just to sum up, everyone's favorite two words. Um, universal health benefits are an important and challenging global uh, uh, goal for global health, but I think what Dean has been saying for so long and what is absolutely true uh, this is it's complicated doing a benefit cost analysis. It really is. And so I think thinking more about that is important. No matter what, we should include the value of reduction of risk of financial distress. We should include social equity weights to capture the fact that some of the very sickest are, are getting benefits. Um, but valuing the social impact on providers is a lot more challenging, and I think that's where we could really stand to do uh, use some uh, progress. And that's it. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation and the paper. Now the floor goes to Calypso uh, for. Thanks for that. No, but that's that's wonderful, and. Uh, and also, caveat, I'm not an economist, so I apologize. I've had a lot of help from Mead um, uh, in understanding this paper and the whole field, which I think is really a really important uh, field. And what the paper does, I think, really well is starting to sort of disentangle all these uh, perhaps misunderstandings and try to explain away some of the discrepancies uh, in, in what's being reported, certainly in the American press. And it is very important because it's influential. All these reports do matter immensely. So, I won't go into to detail. Insurance can do good things that, uh, that uh, have been set out, but can do bad things too. It doesn't have to be uh, progressive. It could well be regressive. And you, the examples of the transfers from poor to rich or indeed from service users to providers and then on to CEOs' um, uh, salaries. Um, and not being an economist, what I thought of initially when uh, I read the paper was well, what are the design features? Because the paper does set out that it's a design issue, right? You can you can make it better. So, what could design uh, features be, which could uh, make an insurance scheme in a developing country more uh, more progressive? Um, and I, I listed a few examples uh, there, and obviously, you know how premiums are established, uh, co-pays, exemptions, um, uh, whether it's mandatory or voluntary. And I'll talk in a minute about Nigerian voluntary insurance scheme. Uh, where there's major issues and insurance hasn't really managed to take off, whether it's uh, uh, functions at state or federal level, or indeed whether it's overlapping issues, and this is a, a problem in India, whether it's an entitlement. We know in Latin America, uh, insurance uh, uh, can be quite regressive because a lot of benefits of people who are insured uh, come about through them taking uh, the state of the insurance companies to court. And then the judges basically uh, determine that they should get access to things that are not in the package. Um, and there's evidence that this can be quite regressive because people who use the courts know how to use the courts and tend to be uh, wealthier and better educated. The degree and na nature of public financing, again, in, in very poor settings, with high rates of informal employment, et cetera, you can't expect insurance to operate the way it operates in the U.S. The role of the private sector, I think that's rather under uh, um, uh, studied. Uh, and I've, I've mentioned a few examples here. So some countries like Brazil and South Africa actually have state-run regulators of private insurance schemes. So in South Africa, you've got these prescribed medical benefits, which sets out what people should get in the private insurance sector. And something similar is happening in Brazil and possibly in Chile. And, and this is now driving in a, in a, in a, in a situation of crisis. It's extremely controversial, and insurers are saying we're being driven out the market and premiums go up and, and coverage rates go down, et cetera, et cetera. Or indeed, the, this idea that if you have private insurance, you, you basically push the rich people to use that and not use the public system, uh, as in South Africa. In, in Britain, it's exactly the opposite. People are encouraged to, to use the, um, the NHS. In fact, the NHS is sort of almost synergistic with the private sector, which may have good and bad things. Anyway, so a number of things to think about. And just some examples. Most recently, this is a really nice uh, set out uh, in the wire of uh, UHC in Karnataka, state after state now announced this universal coverage. Karnataka has nine insurance schemes uh, uh, run at state level, and there's another two at least at the central level that, that interface that. So you've got overlap in terms of premiums, in terms of benefits packages, in terms of and release, and overall it's 
probably not affordable to, to move the word GHC in, in that state or in, indeed anywhere in India unless things really get redistributed significantly, including the pulling um, function. And then uh, a recent piece on Nigeria, and I've quoted there the former head of the Nigerian House Insurance, basically touching some of his design features. So in his comments, he's saying, well, you're saying it's voluntary uh, and everybody must be covered. Uh, but it's a contribution, so why should people volunteer, volunteer to contribute, which is something that, that you've touched on. Um, so you must make it mandatory, but if you do, then the government needs to chip in because 60% of people are below poverty line, so they can't pay, and the government knows they don't have the money to do it. Plus the issue of federal workers, and you see this in different schemes around the world, people who are civil servants work for the government get fairly generous packages. In this case, they're in fact being exempt in Nigeria from actually paying their contribution in in Thailand, we know the vast discrepancies with the civil servant scheme. In Kenya, civil servants get access to uh, cancer drug chemotherapy in a situation where people in the country get access to very little, including no pain control, for instance. So, and I've got a couple of other papers uh, uh, cited there where they, they, they also systematically tried to look at design features, some empirically driven, some more sort of theoretical, if you like, trying to understand what makes an insurance scheme uh, progressive. Um, and with the help of me, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've tried to understand the literature of benefits incidents uh, approach a bit better, and there's a lot of work, as you well know, out there um, in education, in health. Uh, but um, I think the general conclusions are similar to what you've talked about. So primary care services are progressive, education progressive, higher education less so, tertiary care hospitals less so, and there's issues about obstacles and why this is people don't know about insurance or they can't access it or there's cultural norms, behavior, etc. What though strikes me with this approach is this, which comes from one of the papers I cited in the previous slide, that uh, the approach does not deal with the therapeutic value of health services. Um, and it, it's about the monetary value and how that monetary value is distributed across the population. And that made me think as to so whether we're asking the right question. Not that it's not a question you should be asking, but perhaps you should, you should ask uh, more questions on the back of that. So to sum up, um, I think this is this is a great uh, piece of work that moves us on from the sort of dollar value of expenditure subsidies, you know, what does the state spend on you, um, uh, netting it out, uh, minus taxes or contributions. The issue of uncompensated care, I think, is really important, trying to define it. Uh, it's so critical in the U.S., but you know what it is, right, more or less. Uh, but in, as you said, in different settings, what does that mean and what happens uh, when, when others come in to contribute or the state comes in to contribute, what gets displaced? And also, do we care? I mean, fungibility, okay, that's important. But at the end of the day, if, if welfare is maximized, do we care where the money comes from? I mean, what, what, what or should we care? Um, and, and on top of that, the paper also looks at utility. And if you look at the, the McClellan, the original um, Medicare incidents paper, you figure four, where basically right at the end, you show this utility adjusted dollars and, and that's what makes the big difference and make the, the, makes it truly really progressive. It shows that you've got the 1.88 uh, dollar value for the lowest um, um, socioeconomic group. And I think that's really important to consider. So that adjustment is really critical. So would it be important also to start thinking about health outcomes? I think, I think it, it would, and of course people are doing it already. Uh, and I wonder whether um, one of the uh, things you could think about is um, this, and I'll finish because uh, I've stop. this is my last slide. So this is some work that Peter Smith and others did using econometrics methods, and Neil mentioned about. Good. Thanks very much, uh, everyone, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Thanks to John and Dean for an excellent paper, and um, I look forward to talking through it. Um, so I'm Mark Shepard. Uh, do I control this, or do you? Oh, you control it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so next, next one. Uh, so let me just give a brief summary of what we learned, I think, from this paper, because uh, it's a lot of interesting, important material, and, and I think it'll help to go through it. Um, so uh, I think the motivating question here is, how should we think about the question of whether low middle income countries, other countries should expand health insurance via the you know universal health coverage, which ultimately has to be somehow run through the government. And this paper is presenting a benefit cost analysis method to make sense of that uh, issue. How do, how do we count the benefits and the costs given that it's very conceptually complicated? And I think the main benefit that he adds relative to what many people Standard usually think is that the financial benefits of insurance 
matter a lot. So um, uh, next one. Uh, so I think the conventional approach that many in the public health or uh, health policy community think about when we think about health insurance is we're going to value the health benefits of insurance and compare it to the cost. But in practice, this ignores a ton of financial benefits. And what this paper's contribution is, is to summarize methods from the economics literature about how to value those. So three categories that John mentioned, risk protection, uh, consumption smoothing, meaning you know moving money from old to e young people to old who have greater health costs, moving that, that health care profile out over time. Uh, and then the final one, which is uh, more controversial, but certainly important, is redistribution, caring for low-income people, progressive policies. Many people value that as well. And these financial benefits are really going to have to be first order in what, how we think about whether we should have national health insurance, because often the health benefits are more mixed. Often they're home runs, but sometimes they're not. And certainly in the U.S. case, they're not always home runs. So I think the key caveat that John ended on and that it is the focus of the paper is asking really who benefits financially from insurance. It's clear who gets the health benefits, but the financial benefits are a little bit less clear. So certainly some go to the previously uninsured, but the, the, the conundrum that we're really facing as economists studying this issue is that a lot of the benefits are going to people who, to, to providers who would have given free care or charity care, it, it's sort of the way I like to think of it, to the uninsured had they been uninsured, but that goes away if they have insurance. Uh, so an, another way of saying that is that public insurance crowds out, crowds out private charity care, and that can help explain why when we go to measure whether low-income people are benefiting a lot in terms of what they're willing to pay for health insurance, we just don't get a very big number from that, at least in the U.S. context. Uh, and I think it's kind of trying to close the loop on why there can be such big financial benefits, we think, but individuals, individual beneficiaries are not necessarily the ones who will be willing to pay a lot for that. Next slide. So uh, just to give a couple comments about what health insurance buys, um, I think the, the real confusion here, the reason why it's so hard to talk about this issue, is that the standard economics model is a little bit off base in thinking about health insurance. And what's nice about John's paper is it brings in the correction, the standard economics model that make it more sensible and that value this in a more uh, sensible way. But I think the reason why it can be so confusing is that if you start from the standard public health view, you're thinking about health insurance buying health. But in the standard economics model, insurance is about protecting against a fixed loss. There's some risk, H, uh, if you're sick, that you're going to incur. And insurance is not about buying more health care or more health or anything like that. It's just about insuring that risk, all about risk protection. Next one. But I think in reality, health insurance just is not like that canonical model, particularly when you talk about poor individuals, which is the setting that we're talking about for public insurance for low- and middle-income countries. And the poor can't necessarily afford health care on their own, so their own financial risk just in some sense, can't be that big, right? They don't have as much money. Uh, and second, they tend to receive a lot of charity care when they're sick. You know, you can still get some care from charitable providers when, when you're sick, and that can go away when you lose health insurance. So, so the poor public health insurance is not necessarily, you shouldn't think of it as protecting risk, nor necessarily about just buying health, but it being a way of supplementing or replacing private charity care. And I think that's how I, I uh, would encourage them to continue thinking about it. Um, why don't you click to the end of this slide? Uh, a couple, yeah, that's it, okay. Uh, so I think the main thing that is, I think about the results of the study, the work we've done to study health insurance in the US, particularly Medicaid type programs, we think health insurance buys access to care without the whims of private charity. And it might be worth thinking about expanding your framework to allow for that. So there's some financial risk protection. There's some benefit to individuals, and certainly that, that shows up in, the, in the, their analysis. But there's more important sort of what I call mental risk protection. It's not about marginal utilities and smoothing consumption across states of the world. It's about peace of mind, avoiding hassles and stresses of unpaid bills that I think is really just first order in how we should think about providing health insurance. 
uh, on, a, on a public basis. And that's, by the way, totally consistent with what we found in the Oregon experiment, where the, piece, the self-reported health, the mental health, was dramatically improved, even as it, we, couldn't, we couldn't find sort of diabetes improving or other things like that. Okay, next slide. And why don't you just click to the end? Good. Um, so how would you incorporate that into their model in the paper? Well, instead of just thinking about the, cha the value of insurance or the social welfare value of insurance as values of health plus financial benefits, uh, I don't know if this works. No. Uh, uh, values of health and financial benefits minus government costs, and then this sort of ambiguous transfer of charity care that we don't know how to value, and so implicitly in the policy debate, it's going to get written off, uh, and people are going to assume just mathematically that theta, uh, uh, theta CC is zero and we don't value charity care. That thought experiment, I think, is wrong. I think what we should be thinking about is that, first, we need to allow for other utility benefits of health insurance, like these peace of mind. That could be folded into health, but it's not going to be in diabetes uh, or heart disease measures that we found in the Oregon experiment. It's going to be in other things like self-reported health. So we need to value that self-reported health. And then second, I think if we think about this not as crowding out private charity care, but as potential for the government to work with private charity providers to care for low-income people, and they can either work together or there can be a tax so that that money that's currently being spent on charity care is fungible with government money being used to supplement that. That's not a million miles away from where we are in the U.S., by the way, but it certainly is, is true in many developing countries. Then really the net cost of insurance is just the government cost minus the change in charity care. And if you can design a, an insurance plan, a public insurance plan, so that the government cost is equal to what that charity care is already providing, then there's no cost of public health insurance as long as the poor and maybe the providers of health care themselves prefer formal insurance to a disorganized private charity scheme, then it's a win-win. It's a and so I think even though there's sort of a very circular, confusing rhetoric around public health insurance in this setting, I think the message here is that because there's so much private charity already in health care, if we can design public health insurance systems that work with that and provide equal benefits at a better, sorry, equal cost, but a better benefit to the uh, uh, low-income person, then public health insurance is a win-win. Okay, so I'll end with that and thank John again for uh, an excellent paper and Dean too. Thanks to the discussions. Now, before we open the floor for comments, questions, and other, I would give uh, the floor again to, to John if uh, you want to reply, to respond. Do you have any thought uh, on, on the comments you received? Oh, it's on already. Okay. These are terrific comments. Thank you. Um, I've already uh, stolen several of them. <laughs> we have. So um, I, let's just. Uh, open it up at these really helpful ones. Thank you. So the floor is open. I see Lisa. So this is not a topic that I've thought about before, so I greatly appreciate the paper. Uh, one thing, this may sound like a really naive question, but uh, those of you who do a lot of benefit cost analysis, we talk about the damage function approach. I, I think uh, Brad's case study is a good example of it where he, we don't have any way of valuing um, holistically all of the outcomes of the program. So what we do is we value fatal risk, non-fatal risk, all the other outcomes, and then we add them all up. And one thing we have to worry about, of course, is double counting. And I'm thinking, wondering whether you've thought at all about the double counting issue in this uh, setting, because um, uh, we've obviously got ways of uh, valuing the health outcome, mortality, and morbidity. Uh, both those health outcomes and improved health um, also help you financially. Um, and uh, um, we can imagine that there's a lot of other outcomes that we might be worried about in benefit cost analysis where this issue of, may, of double counting may also come up. But I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um, no, that's a great point. I think at this stage, we're. Um, <laughs> Sometimes I, I, when I have a discussion sort of with my son who's a chemist and he's trying to get things to the fifth decimal place. And, um, and, and what I point out is we, we just try to get like the sign correct. <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and so that's kind of how I, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and so, so my guess is like a lot of the financial protection also comes back to the health in the same way that the credit scores come, you know, we improve cardiovascular health and the long-term effects are, I think, also substantial and that you don't pick them up in two years, but you may pick them up, you know, 30 years out. So I completely agree. We'll be uh, vigilant about double counting, but, but I think at this stage, just to kind of get a, sense for what's going on is, is uh, I'd be happy. So meet over Center for Global Development. Um, I really enjoyed this session a lot and uh, I do think it's great when we can get people who have primarily been thinking about these issues in the United States to, to focus on developing countries. Um, uh, Calypso was able to bring some of that developing country context I think in her comments uh, what is charity here? Um, but there's something that I think we, we're we very concerned about when we work on health economics in the developing world that, that we are also concerned about in the United States. And that's uh, the quality of healthcare itself. And that's something that was completely eliminated. So I want to go back to what Larry Summer, one of, one of, one of Larry Summer's great sentences from his uh, this conversation this morning with Ian, which was that he learned, you know, in his older age, as he matured, he learned that actually institutions are important. So when you're asking that individual in the developing world uh, how much he's willing to pay for insurance in order to go to that public sector institution when his alternative is the charity, one of the things he knows is that the charity is actually pretty good care, uh, whereas the public sector institution is really rotten. And so when you're asking him to pay for that rotten insurance to go to that rotten, uh, uh, that's a real issue. So I, I just I think we need to build into this, the supply side of the UHC formula, uh, which is not at all transparent. So um, that's, that's my major question. How would you uh, accommodate these quality of care issues when you're analyzing the benefits of UHC? <laughs> I think it's a really interesting comment, and I, I wonder if the situation, uh, the, the right way to think about it is whether, uh, so one thing that struck me about what you said is that the, the charitable medical system might be higher quality and separate from the public medical system. Are we thinking about, why are those separate medical systems? <laughs> In the United States, the, the public medical system, the public insurance system, has really built off of and worked with the charitable system uh, and, you know, with some conflict, but, but they really encourage each other. And I wonder if thinking about them working together is, would be better. But more broadly, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the standard, you know, the, the mass of insurance in which we value insurance as risk protection is just not at all right for developing world context. We should think about the health insurance system and healthcare system as buying a bundle of health care. And what's challenging about that is that it is fundamentally a social decision, how generous of health care we want. Um, and I, as John said, I did a study you know, figuring out how much individuals are willing to pay for health insurance. But that's not the right number, <laughs> especially for a developing world context, which really raises a challenge for benefit cost analysis because we live off of individual decisions, disaggregated choices and welfare functions, and uh, we may not be able to do that without insurance. I mean, there's sort of a question for, for all of you who are far more experienced in this, in this field. Um, you know, again, when Larry mentioned that when, you know, the World Bank spends a, a dollar on health insurance, I'm providing health clinics that the country scales back by 30 or 40 cents from their health budget. Question is, if you reversed it, would the same thing, what would, you know, if you sort of played this in reverse, would the same thing happen? Suppose the government did commit to expanding its budget, would you observe a reduction in the degree of, of aid from other countries? I don't know the answer to that. And, but it seems like it's really critical in thinking about how charity care is, is responds to expanding coverage in what one would hope improving quality. Maybe it wouldn't because it would be still the place to go if you can go for care. So I don't know. 
for the act. Um, I wonder uh, whether, in fact, there is um, a growth in literature that could be um, very helpful here, um, behavioral economists uh, looking at the lives of the poor and the growing sort of appreciation of what happens uh, by 10 o'clock in the morning in the life of a sort of ordinary middle class person and what has happened in the life of someone who's got very few resources by 10 o'clock and the consequences for that, the knock-on impacts on, on habits, on uh, you know, how your lives kind of can fall apart and the worse and worse sort of decisions that you end up making when you're exhausted and under constant stress. So it seemed to me that we're starting to be able to get to a point that where we could quantify um, the, 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 the benefits from having, uh, for example, Medicare. I mean, everybody knows that when you get to be 65, it's kind of like, whoo, this gets easier from here on out, right? So it, it, we should be able to have a palpable sense of that. And I think there is beginning to be growing data, both in uh, developing countries and domestically, on the, the cost, the immediate cost, and then the knock-on impact of these kind of stress factors and confusion uh, that, um, and bridges people have to cross, patterns people have to put together. I wonder what you're I think that that's a terrific comment, and I think, you know, what people were surprised at in the Oregon experiment was how much sort of the markers for exactly this kind of peace of mind, how how much they responded. And, and if, I, if I had to guess, if we were to do this again, that you'd ask more questions exactly about, like, how this benefits you in ways that I think, again, people didn't expect. They were so focusing on, like, biomarkers, and they didn't expect that self-reported health would jump, that credit scores would would go up so much. I'm almost reminded of the National Guarantee Experiment um, about 20, 30 years ago, where the biggest effects were uh, an increase in divorce rates. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. Where, where people did not have to stay. Yeah, you could leave the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but how do, I, I mean, putting the question back, I, I agree with the evidence that you're raising, but if individuals have such a stressful life that they can't make rational decisions around their choices, then how do we value that reduction of stress that, in a sense, you can't pay for? And we can't, we can't ask. It raises a challenge to the benefit-cost framework if there are benefits of this type of benefits that simplify people's lives and take them into a fundamentally better and, you know, more... Uh, productive state of life that when you're poor you can't pay anything for and you don't even necessarily appreciate but then when you're when you look back you say that made all the difference I don't know how to think about that in a benefit cost framework maybe it's something for for people to work on or for me to learn more about so I, I think that's the point I wanted to make but then we run out of time I think it's also it's an issue of social evaluation when the National Health Service came to life in the late 40s uh, it wasn't about health, because there was no, not many things a doctor could do back then, really. Um, so it was all about financial protection and peace of mind. And this, this was the advertisements around that time, the posters, the way the government sold it to the people, was precisely that, post-war solidarity. You no longer had to worry about, uh, about basically having to sell your house or, or compromise it. And there was charitable care then as well. So people wanted that. And I think it's about setting those limits, though, how much the society wants to spend on those who are the poorest and the sickest, who benefit from financial protection and health care the most, and whose willingness to pay is inversely related to their need. And then set an upper limit as well about how much are we willing to spend as a society, where do we stop, what you'd call here rationing. And the second point is that the, charitable, the value of charitable care, I, I would guess that most of that spending is out of pocket. We know 77% of pharmaceutical spending, which makes up up to 80% of spending in the poorest countries, actually comes from out of pocket. That's in the low income. It's not necessarily charity. People pay for that charitable care and the faith care contributes. But the care mostly they get, they get out of hospital. They don't go to hospitals to get care. They actually go to the pharmacy and buy something. And in the Congo, that's something on average in the WHO essential medicines list is four times 
the, uh, the, the average price across Africa. So the Congolese pay more out of pocket for basic generics than in, in the US you'd get much cheaper. Th these are the structural and institutional issues one should be looking and not, not asking people how much they're willing to pay to get insurance. Hi, um, Brad Wong from Copenhagen Consensus. So in thinking about taking this to the lower middle uh, income context, uh, have you seen anything or do you think it's possible to take the concepts and the framework that you've developed in that paper to thinking about insurance more broadly rather than health insurance? Because uh, in developing countries, there's not just health shocks. There's all sorts of income shocks, property shocks, and all sorts of things that can happen. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited by this because I, I'm wondering if we can transfer that to thinking about poverty reduction in general. Because you know, poverty reduction is insurance in the developing world context, you know, we're going to be able to, um, we're going to be able to use these to more fully capture the benefits of poverty reduction. So typically when, you know, Copenhagen Consensus is doing a poverty reduction um, cost-benefit analysis, it's conceptually really difficult because it's like $1 out of my pocket into $1 in, in a poor person's pocket and the net benefit is zero is assuming no equity weighting. Um, but that doesn't seem right. There's, there's something, you know, one dollar to this poor person has these insurance benefits that they can, you know, if, if the rain doesn't fall or something, they're they're going to be okay. So, is a is a you know, do you, have you seen anything, or is it possible to take these these uh, these concepts to to that type and get it out of health and more generally about insurance? It's, uh, it's, it's back in an earlier incarnation, I did some work on this, and, and I think if you think about sort of the tremendous degree of uncertainty that people face over their life cycle in terms of earnings, that we did evaluate the value of basically kind of a consumption floor and what was it worth. And it, ch it changes people's behavior, you know, but, but it still provides tremendous insurance value. And I think that's exactly right, that, you know, you, you feel better knowing that there's a safety net, even if you never use it. And I think valuing that is really important, and it's certainly feasible with kind of the standard models that people, that economists use, if you are willing to kind of trust those models. I think it's, it's in the standard, um, you know, release framework of tax policy, thinking about tax, you know, redistribution as insurance. So I wonder if any of the stuff coming out of the release commission or other things like that or has, has sort of empirically evaluated that across the world, or you may know the right reports better than I do. But yes, that's exactly how health, uh, economists thought about insurance when they wrote the canonical model. Uh, sorry, thought about safety net programs and re redistribution when they thought of the canonical model as insurance. Yeah, progressive taxation. But, but you should, we should email more. And I can brush off them. Oh, so I do. Uh try a solution to the question Mark asked, see if you think this is on track, which was about if you have somebody so stressed they can't make good decisions, their uh, willingness to pay for that, to alleviate that is very low because they have no resources. But looking back, if they had been relieved of those constraints, it would be very valuable. It seems to me that's just the difference between compensating variation improvement and equivalent variation for the improvement. And so that's a sort of classic problem in better the cost analysis, which is the right measure. And the usual answer to it is it depends on one way it's framed is what are the property rights to the situation? Or another way to say it is the distribution, whether this person sort of is entitled to the higher level of utility, so it's equivalent variation, or to their existing low level but the compensating variation. Hmm. I think that's, that, I, that sounds roughly right. Um, yeah, that raises the question, right? Where's the entitlement? But nonetheless, uh, that does sound roughly uh, analogous. But, but I think the, the, the idea would be that if you, even if it were, you were entitled to the coverage, and you had the option of cashing it out for, you know, money now, um, which is the the flip side. 
in this world where like you don't know where you're going to be sleeping on Tuesday that that may pr still prove to be irresistible. So I agree that you need to have the willingness to pay versus, you know, willingness to sell. The distinction is really important. That's We need to emphasize that more. But I think getting at this sort of sense of panic is, 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 uh, is I think, important. Too. Sense of panic in the standard utility or <laughs> what, What's yeah. hard about it is that it's a non-financial risk. So in the model, it's a utility shifter, reduces utility, but there's no gains to giving that person money. And yet, because it's just assumed to be a constant reduce, but if actually the money dramatically reduces the panic, <laughs> then it could be quite valuable. Yeah, I mean, but right. The, it, yeah, this gets uh, far, but, but you're right. It, it's like you want to give somebody who's totally stressed. A huge lump sum amount. The Russians did that for the <laughs> program, and people sold sold it to others and got cash, right? Yeah. The, sold, sold the right to access in drugs. Well, yeah. Um, two um, comments, or quite one of them, kind of a question. Um, comment is about how to think about the differences between the high income country environment, the US environment, and the uh, Middle income country, or even more low income country. And I think there are two really big differences that, which we are aware of, but that change the calculation possibly quite a lot. One difference is much less in the way of charity care. So the public insurance, public financed insurance, is a much larger fraction of that is crowding out private expenditures, expenditures rather than crowding out charity. That might be true here. And the second is the low frank hanging fruit that Larry Summers talked about this morning. You know, there are still um, huge opportunities for averting a death for a few thousand dollars. Whereas when I was sitting into uh, meeting with some cardiologists at the risk center uh, a number of years ago, and they were talking about cost effectiveness analyses buying days of life expectancy. And it's just, it was a totally different world. Uh, so that, that's kind of, um, I think we, we need to sort of figure out how to generalize from the U.S. results to take into account that. The other is, um, um, is this um, reduction of anxiety question. And I guess I had thought that the premium people should, would pay for insurance is, is the measure of the value. Of that, if we could get a good sense of and, and, you know, kinds of Medicare evaluation that uh, John's done some work on tuberculosis treatment in India that I've done, we're, we're seeing uh, a modeling of that through uh, an assumed utility function. So, I'm, but I'm thinking that um, first that that is as a first order measure um, not bad, or to put it another way, I mean, the insurance really is that you're buying with your premium um, over your estimated willingness to pay, uh, is um, operating importantly through this um, the psychological factor. The risk aversion is really paying for it. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there are people who argue that the only way you should think about the value of insurance is a change in the ex post distribution of income, which seems to me totally crazy. It's a, a huge amount of it is exactly the panic, the, the anxiety reduction. That, that's why insurance is valuable, I think. Um, Federico Wanais from the International Development Bank. Um, just um, a few comments. Um, the first one is that when we're talking about insurance, and the perspective of peace of mind that you might get from the United States. So having you access to Medicare or Medicaid is one thing. It's the expectation that you're actually going to have access to a certain set of services, which does not necessarily happen in a, in a lower and a middle income country. So I am Brazilian. Um, Brazil, we have universal um, health coverage, and 25% of the population opts to purchase uh, supplemental health insurance, um, and uh, which is uh, dual coverage, so they don't get any deduction for opting to, for leaving um, the public system. And why do they do that? Because of quality and access. 
So I'm in another commission which meets in the same room, which is the Lancet um, High Quality Health Systems uh, Commission, uh, chaired by uh, Margaret uh, Crook. Um, and what we see is that, oh, this promise of universal coverage, universal health coverage, is taken with an assumption that people automatically are going to have access to the service. And, and I, I severely challenge that. So I think that one important thing would be to restrain and maybe tone down the discussion here to um, have insurance to a reasonable expectation of access to a certain um, set of services. Um, otherwise, I mean, I currently live in Peru. Um, Peru has 30% of the population uninsured. Um, there's a subsidized scheme that people can pay um, $5 a month. And if nobody, virtually, I mean, this 30% number is stubborn. I mean, it doesn't move because people say, what's the value of paying $5 for something that I'm not going to receive? So I think that's... Uh, you know, I would I would invite you to um, pay attention to, to to the expectation of actual access to high quality services associated with Thank you. That's a very good point. Well taken. And that's I think that's the takeaway is that this access and hassle psychological costs need to be at the forefront of our future work rather than the uh, as much the financial stuff because we're finding that's really where a lot of the, the story is in valuing health insurance. So I, I take that comment very well. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh sorry, Dean. Go ahead. No, no. Just a quick comment on the health comment reaction. In reaction to the paper that I've done with colleagues on the valuation of public finance and tuberculosis was that that would crowd out not only private expenditures on good tuberculosis treatment, but perhaps more important, it would crowd out the horrible private sector quality. So it's a quality improving measure, <laughs> not something we really talked about, John, but I got several reactions on, you know, you, you under price the private sector, and that's really a good thing, not just because you're crowding out expenditures that poor people are making, it's because you're crowding out um, all the wrong things that are getting paid for in tuberculosis care, malaria care, sexually right. transmitted diseases. I mean, it's a big, big thing. It's quality. People might like some of the private care, but a lot of what they get is really, is really low quality, which is not not neutral point. That's potentially more than so that's a flip story. But, but I think the point remains is that we should, that's something that's really first order. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much to everybody. Please join me in, in thanking the speakers.